You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what is going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Stahl, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast specifically, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. On today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to be talking about a particular player that just recently left the Wildcats, Bryce Hopkins. How much do the Wildcats really miss Bryce? And then also, I want to clarify some comments that were made on yesterday's show, and then I want to run part of that interview again uh, with Isaac Shade of the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. I want to kind of flesh out my thoughts on whether or not Kentucky should even be remotely considering uh, a move f- away from John Calipari. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. I want to remind everybody out there that we are free and available on all platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the show. And if you're listening on podcast, it would mean a ton if you left a five-star review. Bryce Hopkins, if you remember last year, was a little-known forward for the Kentucky Wildcats, former five-star, just hanging out on, on in the depth of the bench, essentially. And uh, during Bryce's limited minutes, he averaged 6.5 minutes a game. He didn't do a whole lot with it. Averaged 2.1 points, uh, was a, a sub-55% free throw shooter, wasn't shooting well from three, uh, wasn't really doing a whole lot in terms of, you know, making an impact whenever he was able to actually get onto the court. And um, he transferred out of the program, to no one's surprise, really, I don't think, and decided, you know, if Chris Livingston's going to be coming in, if Jacob Toppin's going to be back, kind of between that 3-4 hybrid spot, you know, I don't really think I want to be in a place where I'm sitting on the bench again. Understandably so. So he left for Providence. And at the time, nobody really made a whole lot of out of it, right? Nobody really assumed that he was going to blossom into anything particularly incredible after having a relatively, you know, quiet freshman year. I don't know if you've been paying attention. But Bryce Hopkins has been playing pretty well uh, for the Providence Friars, who are now 13-3. and three. And Hopkins, if you do not know, I'll just run down his numbers real quick. He is averaging, he went up from two points a game to 16.4. He's averaging 16.5 points a game for Providence. He's averaging 9.2 rebounds, 2.3 assists, while shooting almost 50% from the floor and 38.7% from three. Pause for effect. I mean, you've got to be kidding me, right? And in the most recent game against UConn, number four UConn, Providence beat the Huskies 73-61, to and Hopkins poured in 27 points and made 13 free throws. And he fouled out. He didn't play the entire game. He played all but five minutes, but holy cow. I mean, you've got to be kidding me, right? To see a, a player leave Kentucky's you know, realm and go somewhere and go from being essentially nothing on one roster to being the superstar on another roster. And to be honest with you, Providence could probably hang with the Wildcats right now and beat them. You know why? Because we've seen them now beat number 24 Marquette and we've seen them beat number four UConn now. I mean, you've got, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, shocking sometimes whenever things like this happen. For me, it was completely out of the blue. Because even as we discussed it here on the show, we're like, we gave Hopkins his flowers. We said that, you know, he was probably going to pan out. I did not expect it to be such a quick jump. But he's looking like a first-round draft pick right now. He looks so comfortable with the ball in his hands all of a sudden. Every single statistical metric he's jumped up in. Now, he's turning the ball over a little bit. But overall, I mean, he is, he is a very solid player all of a sudden. And in response, I think Big Blue Nation has kind of been uh, a little upset. Saying, like, oh, I can't believe we, we let go of him. Oh, I can't believe this happened. Oh, what, whatever. So the question on today's show, how much should Kentucky miss Bryce Hopkins? 
I'm going to say here, and some of you may be upset with this. I'm going to be frank. I don't really care because there's nothing any of us can do about it. I don't really think, I think it's a difference between missing him and understanding the situation that he was going to be in. How much should Kentucky miss Bryce Hopkins? I don't really think they should right now because of what he would have been doing on this roster. Even if he got minutes, let's say he did get minutes. Let's say he got 15 a game. Probably would have, what would have been the ceiling for him considering the rest of the roster? Do we really think that Hopkins in this system that Cal's running, do we think that that would have been an area where he would have just all of a sudden thrived like he is at Providence? No, I don't think so. I don't think the same things that were happening at Kentucky, I don't think if those things continued, if they stayed the same, Hopkins would have just automatically, with some more playing time, popped off and then just become a star for the Wildcats. There was no indication of it. It takes a change of scenery sometimes. It takes a change of coaching. And Providence ended up being that spot for him. And on top of that, look, if we want to talk about the rotation, I know Kentucky's hurting at the four spot right now. But I think also... It's an interesting time, considering what Jacob Toppin's owned for two games in a row now. If he can somehow make it three against Alabama this weekend, I mean, all of a sudden, we're, we're sitting here saying, well, actually, Jacob Toppin proved to be as valuable as an asset as we thought he was whenever Kentucky was playing in the Bahamas. So this is not to say I don't think Bryce Hopkins, Hopkins is good. Clearly, his potential has been unlocked. But it was I don't think it was going to be unlocked at Kentucky. Kentucky fans can be can can be upset that they let a player that had that potential get away. But I hope everybody out there listening understands the potential was probably never going to be seen. Not now, not 2 years down the road because of what Kentucky's recruiting class is going to look like. Bryce Hopkins would have been stuck in a position where he would have never been able to unlock that for himself. And honestly, that's more important of him going somewhere else and finding that potential and realizing it than staying at Kentucky just because, just so that you can have somebody that, oh, could pop off one day. You want somebody that plays well for you now. And in this system, Hopkins was not doing that. Hopkins apparently needed different direction, and that's what he's getting with the Friars. And so I hope that he's able to continue to make his career uh, can, uh, just do a complete 180 from what it was as a freshman. I hope he's able to kind of make that into something special. And I hope that Kentucky is able to continue to utilize Jacob Toppin and the, you know, the power forwards in the forwards period, like Chris Livingston, they're able to make them into what they need to be. So I'm content right now. I'm content. Should Kentucky miss Bryce Hopkins? No because I don't think he was ever going to be truly seen for what he is right now at the, in Lexington. That's just my thought on it. If you disagree with that, let me know in the YouTube comments below. Also, if you're listening on podcasts, you can hit me on the socials at Locked On UK. I want to do some clarifying here for, uh, for, for what I said with Isaac Shade on yesterday's episode, and I'm going to run that conversation, part of it, one more time. Before I do that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for your sports betting info, stats, news, analysis. You can get the latest odds and trends for every professional league out there from pro football, college bowl season's wrapped up, the national championship's coming up on Monday. You've got college basketball. You've got NBA basketball. They've got everything over at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts like this one, you can find those at BetOnline as well. They are always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. You can head to the website today or use your phone to learn more about the trends and the action. That is Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, continuing along here on the Thursday edition of Locked On Kentucky, Lance Daw hanging out here with you. So on yesterday's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we had a conversation with Isaac Shade, host of the Locked On Tar Heels podcast and co-host of the Locked On College Basketball podcast. And we kind of went over some of the frustrations that you guys have had, that I have had, the fan base has had, about John Calipari and what's been going wrong, not just this season, but over the past few years, and not just the short-term, but the long-term concerns. 
and we went over the things that we've talked about quite a bit on this show that you guys have talked about in the comments, right? The offense is not where it needs to be. The rotation is weird. The players that Cal brought in as far as transfers, you know, they're not executing at the level that we anticipated. All these different things, yada, 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 yada. And then finally, at the end of the episode, Isaac made a suggestion. It's like, well, we know that this is never going to, this is not going to happen anytime soon, that Cal's going to be let go. Because if they did right now, it'd be $39 million and change to get rid of him. Doesn't really make sense for a former national championship winning coach. Who, fair, he did win his national title a decade ago, but it's a national title winning coach. There's no point in getting rid of him now. But, Isaac said, humor this for a second. If he were to be let go or if he were to step down, who would Kentucky look at? And I gave two answers. And apparently, some of you did not like one of the answers that I gave because you said he was not proven. And that would be Nate Oates. The other, the other name I had out there was Jay Wright. But I don't think that Jay Wright's coming out of retirement to go coach Kentucky. I would love for him to. I just don't see that happening. I don't think there's enough out there to even to make, uh, make him coming out of retirement period a reality. But, it, hey, weirder things have happened. I'd love to see it. I'm not opposed to Jay Wright. Some of you apparently think because I talked about Nate Oates more, I'm, 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 I want Nate Oates as my head coach right now. Let me be very clear. Not only do I think that Kentucky's not making a move right now, I don't think that by the time it happens, Nate Oates will be the best name on the market. That's why I said in the episode, look, earlier in the summer when you guys were and I were talking about this, my whole point was that if Kentucky wants to move on, who are they going to get right now? Who are they going to pull away from another school that would be good enough to do this? And so some of you, and I'm not speaking for all of you, some of you have made it very clear, if he's not won a national title, we don't want him. Which I think is an idiotic um, perspective to have. I think he needs to have, a, he needs to have an established resume. He needs to prove on his resume, that he can, in fact, bring you to a Final Four, bring you to an Elite Eight. And so I think Nate Oates, right now, while very young in his career, has potential with Alabama to do some cool things. Now, here's the problem with Nate Oates. He hasn't won a national title yet. In fact, I don't even think he's made it past the Elite Eight, if I'm not mistaken. He's not made it past the Sweet 16. But he's only had two stops. Coach Cal had like three or four. And I think Buffalo would be a pretty difficult place to get past the round of 32. I don't know. That's just me. Alabama completely choked. They're a really good team in 2020 when they couldn't get past the Sweet 16 as a two seed. But this season, who knows? We may be singing a different tune. I'm not saying Alabama's going to win the title. I'm not even saying Alabama's going to make the Final Four. But what I'm saying is what I liked about Nate Oates, and this is what will appeal to me whenever other candidates come up in the future, because Cal will retire at some point, whether it be now, whether it be six years from now. What I like about Oates is the fact that he has not only proven that he can coach a modern offense, he can recruit. He can recruit well. Now, some of you in the comments said, well, what has he won with that? I think it may be a little bit of a different answer whenever he gets to Kentucky. It's different. It's a, it's a different tier of program. The talent acquisition, got to be a little bit easier. <laughs> and again, I'm not speaking for everybody here, but I would say that the majority of the comments that I've gotten and the most, of, most of what I've heard online and most, oh, actually, excuse me, everything that I've heard in person from Kentucky fans is that the offense needs to be changed. Why, all of a sudden, are you then hung up on what Nate Oates is doing with his offense if he's recruiting five stars and scoring points? Well, what does he want with it? Again, I want to reiterate, it's Kentucky. You give a man the resources that Kentucky has, and he's going to be successful. So I think, I'm not advocating for Nate Oates here. I'm not saying Kentucky needs to hire him. I'm saying in the future, this is the whole point I want to make here. In the future, when Kentucky goes to hire a new coach, the boxes they need to check 
are obviously resume. Can you make a deep tournament run? And can you do it more than once? Number two, can you recruit? Can you get the five stars? Because we can certainly get them here for you. It'll be much easier here, but have you proven you can still get them? And then the third thing, are you actually modernizing what you're doing on the court and what you're teaching these kids? What are the X's and O's? What are you doing to make sure that you don't get left behind, essentially, in games like Michigan State? I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that right now the Wildcats are in, are, are in a good spot next season with what's going to potentially happen with, um, with this, this five-star class that, that's coming in. And again, I want to reiterate, I'm not saying Kentucky should hire Nate Oates. I'm saying in the future, they will be looking at somebody like him. Like, no doubt about it, they'll be looking at somebody like him. If they don't want to hire somebody that has some type of ties to the program already, they will be looking at somebody that runs a modern offense can, and cr- can recruit five stars. By the way, Alabama beat Michigan State by 11 on a neutral court earlier this year. Kentucky couldn't do it in two overtimes, and they had several opportunities to close out. And I'm not saying, oh, well, then that's the reason you should hire Nate Oates. I'm just saying different styles of basketball can be successful. And just because Nate Oates hasn't gotten all the way there yet doesn't mean he won't because he's still so young in his career. One more time for anybody out there that may argue with me in the comments. Do I think Kentucky should fire Coach Cal right now? No. Do I think Kentucky should hire Nate Oates? No. Do I think that Kentucky will hire somebody in the future that is similar to the way that Nate Oates is currently coaching college basketball? Yes. That is all I'm trying to say. That's all I'm trying to say. I want to re-air that conversation with Isaac Shade in just a second. Before I do that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat that doesn't have all the fat and calories, then you've got to try Built Bar. We just got through the holidays, and my goal, like last year, is to eat a little healthier this year. Been doing pretty good with it so far uh, this uh, this January. And if you're like me, where you want to eat healthier, but you don't want to compromise the taste of things, then we've got just the the right thing for you. You've got to try these built bars. With built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious you won't even think that they're good for you, and they are perfect for your New Year's resolution. And what makes built bars good? You say, well, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievably good flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond. If you've been listening to the show for over a year, you know salted caramel is my favorite, absolutely. And I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. What's even better is that they are really healthy for you. Only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. Now you don't need to wait around to get your box for years, we've been talking about ordering your bars at Built.com, but now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. You can head to your nearest Walmart today, walk into the pharmacy section, and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. We also hear, if you've been listening to the show for a while, it's salted caramel and it's cookies and cream. We used to have a cookies and cream bar on the uh, set for like months, like we would, <laughs> and then after the show, I'd probably eat it, eat it to be honest with you. Uh, but they're really, really good, and now they're in stores. If you're close to a Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box of our hit flavors. Again, brownie batter or churro, and you can thank me later. Joining me off the top here is the host of Locked on Kentucky, Mr. Lance Dow. We want to thank you for making this your first listen or watch every single day. Don't forget, we're free and available anywhere you get podcasts. Coming up later on today's show, North Carolina has received two top 30 commits in the class of 24 in the past week vaulting them to the number one class currently we will unpack both of those guys with jason jordan our director of college basketball recruiting but before we get to that lance whoo kentucky survives on tuesday night they shouldn't have had to survive but they did 74 71 over lsu in rup a place that i've been just once but it was to see taylor swift oh (laughs) <laughs> it's not it's not wrong i'm actually being very serious oh, i respect <laughs> it <laughs> it was a gift for my wife's birthday one year despite the win there's been more talk from big blue nation than i ever remember about coach cow's place in lexington 
bigger than the the start to this year, it's been building. Let me just run through a couple quick numbers, and then I just want to see where you're at with it, what you're hearing, and where we go from here. 2021, the year after COVID canceled everything, obviously kind of a miserable year for the Wildcats, 9-16, and 8-9 in the SEC. Last season, 26-7, and 14-4, and four, a very solid year, if unspectacular by Kentucky standards, but obviously the loss to St. Peter's taints things, and they didn't win the SEC regular season or conference title. This year, off to a 10-4 and four start, 1-1 one and one in the SEC. Remains to be seen what will happen in terms of conference championships and things like that. The last Final Four was 2015, the last and only national championship under John Calipari. It's 2012. Notably, haven't won an NCAA tournament game since the quote-unquote lifetime 10-year contract was announced. And it certainly doesn't help that uh, it used the UCLA job to get that leverage. And now UCLA has done really well under Mick Cronin with, yikes, Johnny Juzang leading the way. All that to say, the fan base, Lance, is understandably frustrated. The question becomes, do the decision makers feel the same way as the fan base? I think it's an interesting time to be a Kentucky fan right now because, Isaac, I started doing this show a little bit over a year ago, and I thought when in March, whenever the loss to St. Peter's came, that this would kind of be water under the bridge, right? Eventually, things would start to kind of shape up. Things would return to form. I was very excited about this upcoming season, and I did not expect the collapse I think we've seen in this early season in big games to actually happen. We heard a lot of talk this offseason about change, about adjustments, about modernizing certain things on the floor, and we just haven't seen that. And so it's quickly started to shift from the the tone in the fan base from my perspective from, oh, maybe it's a small minority to, okay, now almost everyone is pointing out the flaws that are happening right now, both on and off the court for Kentucky. A big point of contention earlier this offseason was recruiting. And I was like, I think that's going to eventually come around. Kentucky has proven that they can do that. Coach Cal obviously went out and signed one of the best classes, if not the best class in next year's uh, upcoming recruiting cycle. I think right now, based on what we've heard from the fan base, there are legitimate frustrations and there are legitimate concern. Now, does that mean that there is legitimate frustration and concern from the people in power? I think that's another question with a different answer right now Kentucky is locked in seemingly to a lifetime contract so to speak with John Calipari and you and I were talking just a little bit before we went on air it feels like if Kentucky were to go that route it would not necessarily be the wisest thing considering (laughs) how much money they would have to pay to get rid of a national title winning coach now something I will say here quickly Isaac it has been a decade since he has won that national title and on top of that What is Kentucky, if not a team that consistently competes for national titles? They haven't won an NCAA tournament game, like you mentioned, in quite some time. I mean, at some point, you have to start asking asking the question, when do things change? Yeah, Yeah, that's a great question. And I think you're right. Like, I I did the math a little bit (laughs) ago. And if if my number crunching is correct, if Kentucky was to buy out John Calipari after this season, they would owe him... $39.75 $39.75 million still. I mean, it's just dumb. And as you said, this recruiting class coming in is ballers. They are ballers. Not to mention who knows what Kentucky will do in the transfer portal as they've continued to do. And so it just seems like it doesn't make any sense to, to really begin to have that conversation. But man, the I don't think we're at a tipping point. As you said, I think the answer is different from the decision makers than it is the fan base. But the fan base is a lot of those people with a lot of those dollars that you would need if you were going to make any changes. So uh, you you don't want to head in a different direction than you're heading right now. That is certainly for sure. And something I'll say right now, as far as the short term goes, I mean, I think it's very foul at the frustrations that we're seeing. I mean, obviously, with the issues with the offense and the half court, we've seen a lot of struggles so far this year with Kentucky and crunch time, just not really knowing what to do. I mean, you talked about that close win over LSU last night. I mean, just a brutal game there at the very end where you saw several possessions where Kentucky just literally did not have any movement. 
Had yeah. Jacob Toppin not made that corner three, <laughs> we could be talking about a loss and we could be continuing to talk about a directionless Kentucky that doesn't really seem to have a lot of confidence in itself. So the short term, I absolutely understand the frustration, and I'm right there with the front fan base. If you've been listening to my podcast for any sort of amount of time over the past couple of months, I've been right there. Now, again, I want to reiterate, it does not mean a coaching change has to happen at this moment, right? Things can be adjusted. And I honestly do think when you go back and watch that LSU game, you did see maybe Kentucky starting to maybe change some things and head in the right direction. I agree. To, up to the point of, you know, when things kind of fell apart in the last couple minutes, I yep. think they had built a 10 point lead. And, and uh, I believe the commentators even said, I can't even remember who it was now, but even said, to me, this is the best I've seen Kentucky yep. other than non conference buy games and other than Louisville. Uh, and, and if that's so, like you're moving in the right direction. And I would tend to agree with that. Like there was cohesion, things looked good. Maybe we're getting, you know, Oscar Shibway back to full form now, you know, all of these kind of things. Uh, it was a good night for Severe Wheeler, uh, shooting wise and things like that. If he can do that, watch out, folks. Here we go. Now, Lance. Just to, so that we've done it, if and when we get to the point of saying it's time John Calipari is deciding to walk away or they've come up with and backed up a truck with the world's stupidest amount of money, who would be some of those people we would begin to look at? Now, again, we're just hype, uh, like we're just putting out a hypothetical here. Sure, like we like there, this could be either two years from now or it could be whenever Cal finally decides to hang it up a decade from now. We don't know how much longer John Cal Parry is going to be here. But Isaac, to kind of humor the conversation, <laughs> I think there are two names that you have heard more than any others out there. And that would be Nate Oates and that Absolutely. would be Jay Wright. Now, whether or not Jay Wright is interested in coming out of retirement to coach it for the Wildcats, I don't think that's reality there. But Nate Oates is somebody that I personally would be very excited about uh, as Kentucky's new head coach because he hits the two things you want. He's a good recruiter, and he's an X's and O's guy. You look at Alabama and the way they play the five out, I mean, that's the direction the game is headed over the past half decade. Right. And it's what thrives. And right now, Alabama is the cream of the crop in the SEC. They've got some really talented five-star pre- freshmen that are producing uh, guys like Brandon Miller. I mean, I think that he would be as far as finding somebody to maybe replace and sustain the success that Cal had. I think he would definitely be a solid potential option outside of that, Isaac. I mean, this was a conversation that I had uh, quite a bit on my show earlier this summer is that uh, with some of the fans that were really upset, I'm like, guys, who is going to replace John Calipari? I mean, is there a pl- is there a coach out there right now that fans and boosters and the athletic department collectively would be comfortable with. with. Yeah. 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 Everybody's got to be okay with this next decision. It's got to be somebody that is worth their salt. And so I just don't know if there are a whole lot of names out there in college basketball right now that would leave their current job to go for to Kentucky. But I will say this, I have no idea if he's interested in the job or not, but Nate Oates, I think just looking at his resume and looking at what he's doing with the Crimson Tide right now, he would be a really, really good hire. I think a lot of people would be happy with him. You know, it's funny. I hadn't even heard you have those conversations. He's literally the name on my notes at the top of my list. I love Nate Oates, and I think he would be massive. I think it would make sense uh, to at least think about Mark Pope, you know, bringing somebody back home. Sure. Um, And then you you can't not make a call to guys like Scott Drew and Mark Few because it's the same thing that the uh, North Carolina went through after Roy Williams retired. You got to make those dudes tell you no. Um, who are at the highest level of the sport. And so a really interesting conversation, one that, as you've kind of alluded to, not outright said, but I'll say it, is premature, I think, in both of our estimations. I think for me that John Calipari, even though thing, we're, we're not at the top or the height of Kentucky um, success right now that, that the Wildcats and Big Blue Nation are used to seeing, but I believe that he has earned the right to walk away on his own terms and his contract says as much, quite frankly. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. And premature, I definitely think is a good word for it. But again, just want to reiterate, look, there are several guys right now that I don't think would walk away from their job. But I think to your point, Isaac, you can't just leave them alone. You definitely have to go and reach out to them. So if Kentucky does choose to move on, I would, I would hope that the fan base would understand, regardless of who the hire is, that it would be made in the best interest of the program's future specifically. And it would the goal would be to 
get back to winning national titles. And so I certainly hope that they make that decision if they do choose to walk away from Calipari or they force Calipari to resign, essentially. I hope that they're not making that decision lightly. I think it's very important that Kentucky times this right if they ever do it in the future. And I hope that the decisions, the poll process is made very carefully. Yes, absolutely. Well, we got this year and then six more years left on this lifetime contract. So we will continue to monitor it. But folks, I don't think we're anywhere near anything drastic happening happening in Lexington. All right, that's going to do it for today for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. Really appreciate Isaac Shade joining us to talk about what's going on with the fan base and what's going to be happening moving forward. On tomorrow's episode, we got a big one. Kentucky versus Alabama. We're going to be talking about what that matchup could look like. I'm really excited about actually heading into that game. <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to get some interesting comments about Nate Oates after that one. Uh, but it's going to be fun. Make sure you are tuned into that. That's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On UK. You can follow the show uh, on Instagram at Kentucky Podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Tall underscore. Again, questions, comments, concerns, leave them in the YouTube comments. Hit me on the socials. I will see you two all tomorrow for another episode of Locked On Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. And God bless.